Thank you for joining us today. I'm Kevin Clyer of DSD, and together with our partner, Newmark School and Steelcase, we're proud to have put together an exciting program through which we'll examine the opportunities, challenges, and the importance of creating learning environments that prepare students to excel in the 21st century and beyond. Today's school and educators are faced with difficult tasks of navigating through the myriad of challenges that come with preparing our students for success in college and their careers. With an emphasis on critical thinking, collaboration, confidence, and creativity, the 21st century learning model is aimed at encouraging our students to think and reason more effectively while we change the traditional approach of both teaching and learning. We're excited tonight to have everyone here and our panel of experts to explore and discuss the challenges that administrators and educators and architects and designers face as they look to implement 21st century learning practices in today's classroom. Tonight's discussion is going to be moderated by Christopher Peeler. Chris is the editor-in-chief of THE Journal, which is our leading resource of administrative, technical, academic technology in the K through 12 sector. In addition to the monthly publication, he edits the newsletter Common Core Tech Update, K through 12 Mobile Classroom, hosts a monthly webinar in EdWeb. You're busy, aren't you? <laughs> Um, and appears regularly on the Education Talk radio. He's presented at numerous education technology conferences, and tonight he's going to guide our discussion. At this time, I'd like to turn it over to Chris. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks, everybody, for coming on this beautiful night, although as a California citizen right now, it feels freezing cold to me. So congratulations for braving the tundra and coming to this event. And what we're going to do right off the bat is we're just going to have our first three panelists introduce themselves so you know who's standing up here. Uh, you already know who I am. My name is Chris Peeler. I'm the editor-in-chief of THE Journal. I'll be moderating things. And to my right, we have... Let's see if this works. Is this on? Yeah. Is it working? Yeah. Okay. Hi. I'm Mark McCarthy. I'm a design principal at Perkins Eastman Architects. We're the architects of, uh, of the school here. And uh, I've been been an architect for about 20 years, most of that time working on K-12 projects and head up our um, primary and secondary education studio in New York. I'm Carl Agriteria from Audiovisual Associates. I've been with Audiovisual Associates 18 years. I'm the senior project manager. Uh, we installed the, install the uh, audiovisual that you see in this facility, as well as uh, higher ed and lower ed locations. Uh, my name is Dr. Regina Peter. I'm the co-founder and co-director of Newmark Education, which consists of the Newmark School, Newmark High School, and our Newmark Teacher Training Institute, actually, of, of, of where you're sitting, actually, right now. So welcome, everyone, and we're very happy to have you here uh, seeing our facility. So those are your first three panelists. Now, our fourth panelist is extremely appropriate for this event about the impact of 21st century education because he literally wrote the book. Ken Kay is the author of The Leader's Guide to 21st Century Education. He also co-founded the Partnership for 21st Century Skills, of which he served as the president for eight years. Currently, he is the CEO of EdLeader21, which is a professional learning community for educators committed to 21st century education. And Ken's going to get us started with a little bit of context about what exactly we're talking about when we're talking about 21st century education. So I'm going to walk the mic over to Ken Kay. Good evening. This is an incredible space. Yes? yes. This is a fabulous space, really. And um, so I'm going to use it. I'm going to walk around a little bit. And uh, my role here, I want to really appreciate, uh, appreciate the s and and Chris made the suggestion that I spend the first 10 minutes with you to try to set up the dialogue. And actually, let me tell you why I think that was a good idea. Let's go back two slides. The impact of 21st century learning on architecture, design, pedagogies, and technology. And the point here is, it would have been easy to start the evening talking about what a 21st century school might look like. It might have been easy to talk about what 21st century technology might look like. But if you haven't decided what a 21st century student is and what a 21st century student competencies are, you really can't answer those questions. So my role is to help you 
grapple with this issue of what's the profile of a 21st century student. That's, that's basically what I've been doing for the last 12 years. So I wanted to start with this slide, and if those of you have your program, open your program to this page, because this way you'll know you can take this slide home with you. All right, everybody got it? Look at student A. How many of you would say that uh, you grew up in a student A model school. I got everybody, yeah, this is active participation. Those of you not raising your hands will be asked to leave. <laughs> um, okay, so you are um, an employer, okay? Which of these two students are you gonna hire, A or B? I know these are rhetorical, but I need some help here, please. B, B. okay, close call? Not even close. I, by the way, I was with an employer in Phoenix who said, S I want student A. I said, please explain that. He goes, well, I got a job for them to do and I don't want them to ask me any questions. <laughs> okay. You're developing 21st century citizens. You want a 21st century citizen, A or B? B. I was in Ohio and a guy got up and said, which country? There are some countries where you might prefer student A. In this country, we'd prefer student B. Okay, student A or student B, which is gonna be better at addressing their personal challenges? Family challenges, health challenges, financial challenges, A or B? Okay, so those were all relatively easy questions. This is the hard question. Why is it that all of you, I was gonna say all of you, why is it all but two of you raised your hand and said you wanted student B? And the model of education in most schools is still stuck at student A. How many educators do we have in the room? Okay, well help us out. Why are we still stuck in a student A model when everybody in the room wants student B? Because we're testing towards it. The testing system is, it, it, and it's easier to assess probably student A, but all the assessment is stuck at student A. Why else do you think? Why else? From the facilities. The facilities? Yeah, we can talk about that in a minute. The, students, the facilities were built around student A, absolutely. What else? Yeah, the teachers grew up under student A model, right? The parents grew up under student A model. The colleges of education teach the teachers student A model, right? It's, it's, uh, it, it's difficult. Yes, sir? It's, I'm sorry? Well, I wouldn't say it's more measurable, it's easier to measure. I, we have measures for these other things. We did, it's a transition to them, but we, we have rubrics for critical thinking, problem solving. When you say measure, we may not have high stake tests for all of them, right? Okay, I was at a public high school on Long Island. In a lot of places, the model was student A, but the best teachers taught, taught much of the student B. I got some of student B out of student A, but it wasn't intentional and purposeful. It wasn't assessed. The teacher, it wasn't the model. The model was student A, and then, well, unintentionally, we got some of the other. It's not that there weren't people. A lot of us actually have those attributes, even though we came out of that system, but it wasn't the intentional, purposeful outcome. The other thing I, I say is, in the 50s and 60s, we were doing a very good job of preparing people for rote jobs, for factory jobs where they do the same thing over and over again, or jobs in which there was a hierarchy and they were basically supposed to do what the management level above them did. Right? We're in a situation now, when we wrote the book, one of the best moments in the book is um, we interviewed a senior executive at Apple who said, we're at the point at Apple now, this, this, and this will have a lot of impact on the panel, we're at the point at Apple now that if someone needs to be managed, they are no longer employable. If somebody needs to be managed, they're no longer employable. How many of you have kids and grandkids and nieces and nephews that are in schools that are truly built around self-direction and self-management as opposed to schools where the kids basically are told to do what they're supposed to do and the kids are supposed to do it, which is not, those kids aren't prepared to, being prepared to work at Apple. So I, I, what I wanted to say to you is that I've spent 12 years trying to help school districts and, and policymakers, although I've given up on them, um, 
make this transition from student A to student B. And it's a very, very important transition, and I think a very important setup for tonight, because if you are stuck in the student A model, your building can be a paint job of a, of a current building. If you start to look at a building like this, the question I'd have is, is what are the outcomes on, in the student B model that you're looking for? And if you decide that every kid needs to be an effective collaborator, which every business that we interviewed told us, then those steel case chairs that are on rollers make a lot of sense because that's how you can help encourage kids to be in a collaborative educational environment. So we have built our work around two quick principles. I'm just going to show you the slides. The four C's. We interviewed hundreds of businesses and they had 30, 40 skills that they said were important. But when they rated all of them the top four skills, were these, critical thinking, communication, collaboration, and creativity. And we got very lucky, they all started with a C. Um, and then we developed an implementation model um, to help school districts and schools understand this is not a light lift. You can't just have your school board pass a resolution and say we're for the four C's. It's a very deep implementation that takes a long time. So I just wanted to end up by showing you a couple of models of schools. This is an independent school in Atlanta, Georgia, the Mount Vernon School. And they have agreed to six student outcomes that they call the 21st century Mount Vernon mind. So no, none of our districts or schools just take the four C's. They adopt it for their own community. They have their own dialogues about them. And you can see these six attributes here. Creative thinker, innovator, collaborator, Solution seeker, ethical decision maker, and communicator. This is a public school district in Arizona. Profile of a career and college ready graduate. Global citizen, self-directed, collaborator, civil, uh, critical thinker, communicator, tech literate, and creative. And that's their profile of a college and career ready graduate. So it's the four C's or it's something like the four C's, it's student B, but every district and every uh, independent school is making their own decision about what that looks like. So let me just end with a quick story, which is that I get asked from time to time to go around the country and help school districts come up with their profile of a graduate. And I was working with a school district in Ohio for nine months, and we actually came up pretty much, this was a community group of about 50 people, business leaders, parents, administrators, kids, um, teachers, everything you can think of. And we spent, we met once every two or three months for nine months, and we came up with a model that looks a lot like student B. And they asked me to come and give a, our pep rally to 400 teachers about why this was so important. And when we're, they were done, what I didn't know was the superintendent had made a decal of the six attributes they had adopted, put the decal on a 79 cent target plate and handed it to me when I was done with my talk. And I thought, my goodness, I went from Tucson to Columbus, Ohio, and I got a 79 cent target plate. But I didn't say anything, I was very gracious, I sat down, the next thing the superintendent says is, bring out the boxes. And he brought out boxes of 400 plates. Now I know why he wanted to pay 79 cents. And he hands out a plate to every teacher and every staff member and didn't say a word till everyone had their plate. And he said, you know, for the last nine months while we've been developing our vision of 21st century education, a lot of you, particularly teachers, have walked up to me and said, are the four C's and our 21st century outcomes just one more thing you're adding to my plate? <laughs> and he goes, no, this is the plate. This is the plate. So the work that we're doing in Ed Leader 21 is to try to help school districts and schools determine what's on and off their 21st century plate. And it seems to me that this student B model might be a reference point for the conversation for the evening, which is once you decide that your profile is of student B, what are, the, what are those implications for technology, for pedagogy, for architecture, for design? And I'll talk a little bit more about the ways in which the, our school districts are taking this model and 
using it as a strategy to implement almost every aspect of K through 12 education. But I hope this is a helpful, thank you so much for your engagement and I hope this is a helpful start for the evening.